Just leave on two, clear take off, left hand. Take off left, it is speed one. Left left, speed west, copy. Hello and welcome to the Blue Skies Podcast. I'm PR Ganapati, your host. It is my great pleasure today to speak to AVM SC Shafikar. AVM Shafikar was commissioned into the Indian Air Force in the transport stream as a pilot in the year 1982. And uh, after many years uh, in which he had flown more than 7,000 hours in various types of aircraft, uh, he recently retired from the Air Force. AVM Shafikar uh, has uh, been credited with several first time activities such as landing an AN-32 aircraft at the highest uh, landing strip, Dalit Bay Goldie at 16,700 feet. Uh, He's been involved with um, the humanitarian aid and disaster relief activities such as Uttarakhand flood relief, Yemen evacuation. He was also uh, responsible and in, in involved with the induction of modern transport aircraft such as the C-17 Globemaster, the C-130 Super Hercules. Uh, he was awarded the AVSM for devotion uh, to duty and uh, he was also um, yeah, awarded a Shara Chakra uh, for the bravery that he demonstrated during uh, that operation at uh, DBO. So we're going to have a fascinating conversation with him today. Uh, but first things first, welcome to the program, sir. Thank you so much for taking time to speak to us. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for calling me over. It's my pleasure to be speaking to you. Thank you, sir. So, sir, as we start with all our guests, we just love to get to know them better. So. Where did you grow up and what was your motivation to join the Air Force? What were those initial years like? Which aircraft did you train on? Okay, so how do I start? I will say I am a small town boy, a uh, place, uh, Nagpur. Now it's not anymore a small town. Basically, an outdoor guy, you can call me. Studied in a very renowned school known as Hadas High School. And uh, thereafter, uh, did uh, college also from here. Now here there is an interesting thing which I like to tell you is uh, I am an Air Force uh, officer. However, during my school days as well as college days, you know, I was in Army NCC. Ah, uh-huh. wow. Okay. <laughs> I did my BSc in uh, uh, Maths, uh, Physics, Chemistry. However, I was more uh, outdoor person. So I was telling you, I had decided to be in Defense Forces. However, which service was not decided? And secondly, uh, I have been brought up as a very practical person. So considering that practicality, I was very clear that I will not join Defense Forces through NDA because I wanted to enjoy the college life. Right. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So that is how I landed up uh, appearing for CDS and uh, cleared in the first go and thereafter i cleared the ssb also my dad was a territorial army chap let me tell you he was not a regular army he was in territorial army retired as an adjutant in the local unit here 118 ta very clearly he had told me that he will love that i join the army but my mother was very very fond of air force so my first choice was uh, naval aviation followed by Air Force and followed by uh, Army. Why Naval Aviation? Because there was a boy in uh, Airwing NCC who had just joined Naval Aviation and he told me a lot about, uh, you know, uh, landing an aircraft on a ship and all. And that age, you, you are not very clear what exactly you want in life. But when it came finally to join, you know, I thought, and I don't regret that any how at all, 
I thought if I have to be an aviator, why not be in a service where aviation is topmost, considered to be the <laughs> So that was Air Force. So here what happened is I got a call from uh, Naval Aviation and I got a call simultaneously for Air Force. So I decided and uh, without telling my dad, let the Naval Aviation thing go. and and join Air Force. So, uh, direct entry boys uh, go to uh, a place, uh, Koimtur, where we had a ground training. Yeah, six months of ground training. Finished that and then uh, reported to Bidar. Bidar is a very quiet place and we had a very difficult kind of an aircraft to fly there, known as HT2. HT2, okay. Hindustan Trainer 2. The uh, number of stories we had heard about this aircraft, you can say folklore only, had already scared us the, a lot. You know, this was a tailwheel aircraft. Now, the aviators will understand the difficulties of tailwheel aircraft. All the aerodynamic forces which act on this aircraft when it is taking off and when it is landing are quite different. So, it does very funny things on its own sometimes and sometimes you add your uh, wrong inputs and make it do further go wrong so this was the ours was the last course on this aircraft mm. oh really wow yes. okay thereafter i think they changed over to kirans and then ht2 uh, hp t32 came in yeah so ours was the last course so uh, here what happened is uh, i was going through quite okay but somehow I was not getting the grip of the flying because I had never seen uh, head or tail of an aircraft earlier. The instrumentation never thought of uh, this uh, aviation as a subject. As people say, na, normally all aviators start looking at the aircraft when they are four years old and jump at the sight of it. For me, there was no such excitement. But my decision was that, yes, I can manage this and I will do it. But the first hurdle was difficult for me to cross, you know, uh, because of uh, two, three things getting added up. The initial excitement about flying, the first time we doing it, then uh, the instructors and the atmosphere there, I was overwhelmed or whatever. I just uh, was not up to the mark. You know, they keep telling even you can make a monkey a pilot. Provided you keep giving him flying, but in forge, yeah, enough time. <laughs> <laughs> but in forge, you know, there is no much time. It is a very clear cut, laid down time that within this you have to be a pilot. So what happened when I went for my solo check? I bounced and uh, got a uh, two extensions. Didn't make it there. And what they call it, TRB, Termination Review Board. I was put across to them. And now I was damn scared because my dad used to keep telling me the rejection rate there is quite high. So think over twice if you want to choose Air Force. So what I did, I never informed my father and mother and just uh, appeared for the uh, TRB. There they give you a chance to speak out that why you have not performed. So let me tell you, I have been a very, uh, you know, frank, open uh, to talking and uh, you know at times blunt kind of a person i used to speak uh, speak my mind that was that is what i was uh, the way i was brought up and in my entire air force service you will see keep seeing this quality coming back uh, or whatever you call it some call it quality some they don't like it so they call it something else <laughs> but that shows <laughs> so as it was my nature i told to the uh, board that, you know, there are a lot of uh, factors which have combined and this is the result. So I can assure you, if you give me two extension, I will clear solo. Now, what uh, that person thought, God only knows, I got two extensions and an excellent uh, instructor. Okay, his name was, I will tell you the name also, Wing Commander Babu Rao. A very, very... Uh, you know, gusty and, you know, full of enthusiasm kind of a person. So he took me up for this uh, sorties, which I got 45, 45 minutes, broken down them further to 15 minutes, 30 minutes. And he used to really encourage me 
and the result was you know you know now i retired as ibm that means the result was i i cleared <laughs> absolutely right so, fascinating you know sometimes yeah. uh, so, all you uh, need is that change in in the instructor that different perspective yes and yes. it brings out the best in you yes at times it does uh, uh, affect you sometimes you don't click along so it is a kind of a thing which i saw so from a army ncc cadet here i was clearing my solo at the first stage from there on we moved to afa flu kirans a beauty jet trainer wonderful aircraft very nice to fly all the apprehensions which we had about flying had gone off in thin air thereafter there is another story you know i will keep telling you and repeating this that decision making whether which way it is going but i have to think over and take decisions the next decision was that i will be a transport pilot you know very few clearly having such vision you will find very few people in indian air force most of them want to join fighters i was very clear that i will like to join transport aircraft because the places they visit the life they have i had a little bit of idea from some people so i i didn't regimentation was not in my blood so much okay so that may also be one factor doesn't matter so i gave a choice as uh, transports and there you get uh, you know the stream based on your performance your choice the number of vacancies so on so forth so luckily i got the transport and i was very happy I landed up at yalanka flew a, another beauty avro aircraft how oh, lovely okay. yeah that was a transport conversion and you know uh, i fell in love with that aircraft because it used to listen to you not like hk <laughs> <laughs> right my but, father has done a lot of the initial testing on the avro when he was oh, at wow. uh, hl kanpur and, okay. and so it's one of his favorite aircrafts too okay. he's flown and it, it it was a aircraft which must have been favorite for many and we had uh, excellent instructors there a very nice atmosphere and you know a jab who was not able to clear his first solo uh, i stood first in flying in that transport conversion on avro aircraft and the first posting was uh, far far in east on a another tailwheel aircraft oh <laughs> yes <Is it> <laughs> very surprising oh. after flying avro got on to otter aircraft oh the otter wow yeah okay. the canadian aircraft you must be knowing about it a tailwheel aircraft and the uh, best part of that was that was the only transport aircraft which you could fly alone Mm-hmm. and in chabua northeast we did a lot of air maintenance that is landing at smaller airfields known as advanced landing grounds the algs like along walong uh, lot of places and excellent seat of pant flying that was what i can call it and the dro- drops also there at very very difficult places anini alini and things like that and a beautiful place northeast i, I fell in love with it along with that i got married also there so my wife also loves that place equally well that is the best station she says and i have taken her to many uh, of the stations but she likes that the most very nice so, so uh, let me just ask you some more about the otter so otter was uh, how what was the capacity how many people would it seat and it was a single radial engine in front is what i seem to remember yes uh, and you used to fly single pilot is it and yes. did you have a navigator or no no were you no. just navigating also yourself yeah there was no navigator it, it was a, it is it was a canadian aircraft piston engine okay nine radial engine right uh, fitted on to the nose of the aircraft a tailwheel aircraft we we had a capacity of around 10 to 12 passengers we should carry or 500 kg of load for drop and uh, you know another uh, very uh, unique thing about that aircraft was captain and co-pilot seats were there the instrumentation was there however the yoke or the stick what you call it was only towards the captain side there was okay. no extension of that stick towards the co-pilot so he is facing the instrument panel and he cannot control the aircraft 
only the trainer had that so the year in uh, you know otter you have controls was like literally you have controls there was a pin in the center you used to pull that pin and that yoke used to fall towards the co-pilot now as a captain you don't have controls ah so we used to keep doing this that is why that aircraft was cleared for a single pilot after few days and we enjoyed flying single we used to navigate it was a slow aircraft so navigation was not very difficult we used to write down the etas and all on the windshield and it was fun flying in uh, over brahmaputra at uh, 2 3000 feet below the clouds normally we used to mention, maintain and fly and a uh, wonderful flying we learned a lot in otters mm -hmm. and it had very good short field performance isn't it yes it means uh, it was like a helicopter you will be surprised to know a, a fixed wing aircraft when he used to be on finals people you, you had to wait for it to come down it's coming it's coming yes still it is coming <laughs> and then we used to arrive and within let me tell you 300 feet it could stop my goodness that oh. was its performance oh. and around 250 to 300 feet it could take off you hold on brakes open power the tail used to go up release the brakes just unstick she used to vertically go up like a helicopter a fixed wing aircraft a basic basic aerofoils massive wings very thick and then and a good beautiful aircraft wow and so as a young officer it must be a tremendous uh, experience you know doing all that yourself which i don't think a lot of people would have got that sort of experience on weather absolutely aircraft, right. right my few coachmates went directly again on uh, avros and few went on a uh, uh, few other aircraft but we were the most happiest and uh, career wise best lot we three coachmates had gone there and all three were uh, you know we have those g categories a b green c green and all so b green we were within two years and we flew almost uh, you know 2000 3000 hours within that four year tenure that was amount of flying we used to get phenomenal flying and as a flying officers we were uh, b green and our CEO, CEO was also very enthusiastic he never allowed us to come out of the cockpit night flying we used to do over at the airfield but four four hours five five hours so a lot of good experience we got <laughs> wow and what was the serviceability and all that like of that aircraft was yeah the, uh, you know very being easy old, to maintain and, mm, mm. yeah ease of maintain you know a piston engine have uh, its own uh, typical problems you know cylinder leaks oil leaks from the cylinder spark plug getting separated from the cylinder are the very common problem but the best part of this aircraft was that even on partial power it could get you to the wherever you want to go so engine failure was not uh, ever experienced always the prop used to rotate and partial power was there one very funny incident i will tell you you means you'll uh, laugh your guts out i can assure you and all the <laughs> others you know we used to have this uh, i told you spark plug used to come out of the cylinder from that where it was uh, fitted so there used to be crack in the cylinder because of overheating or whatever and the spark plug used to come out moment spark plug comes out the oil used to come out from there and now with the prop turning the oil used to come onto the main windshield the front windshield so one incident i had was my entire front windshield was covered with oil i was very close to the base maybe just 30 miles so i with partial power came on finals but the trickiest part was i couldn't see from the front windshield the runway right so, so let me tell you what i did i did the, a zigzag kind of approach i used to go right look through the left window at the runway then turn left like that i came but finals where i want to touch down i had to be straight so what does one do so what i did is i chop power Put, put my head through the window outside, looked at the center line and put the aircraft down. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, uh, wow. I can assure you, nobody could do this in modern aircraft. No way. The advantage was the speed was less. We had a good control over the aircraft and there was no other choice left with me but to do this and make her land. 
and this was not the only case with me there were other pilots also had experience means somewhat some were, windshields were partially covered some were not covered but from outside once they covered we had to do this trick and lie oh boy <laughs> My goodness. What, what was the other transport aircraft in the fleet at that time? So they were Avros, AN-12s perhaps? And yeah, packets, yeah, you are right. Dakotas? Yes, yes. Correct. Dakotas? And, and Caribous. Mm -hmm. Caribous. Caribous, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. They were in East. Caribous were in Guwahati position and we were in Chabua. And uh, Chabua airfield, that time used to be, uh, we will call, used to call you, call that airfield as uh, Chabua International. And I'll tell you why. We had a, a fighter squadron, MiG-21s. We had a helicopter squadron uh, flight there. We had a transport squadron. The detachments of Dakota and Caribous used to come to Chabua to operate in uh, that sector, Tirup and Nagaland and all. Then we had hunters coming for heli flying. So that airfield at a time, you will find transport aircraft on right and downwind. The fighters on left and downwind, some 10 aircrafts piled up overhead coming up back after the air maintenance. So, and it was a fun flying there. It was one of the most remotest place, but flying wise, one of the most toughest. And, you know, sir, you, you were mentioning this B, C, B green. What are these, what are these categories? Basically, we saw, we, as these are instrument rating, basically, so that, uh, that, uh, decides in which uh, weather type of weather you can go and land so if you are uh, master greens then you can land on in, in any weather that is visibility less than 800 meters and things like that so we used to start from d white and go up to a master green there were eight to ten categories in between so b green normally people used to get around uh, you know flight lieutenant squadron leader uh, when they used to reach on other aircrafts but in otters we were the kingpins who used to get uh, B green as flying officers. <laughs> so a lot of <laughs> jealous factor was there. But then we uh, we were very happy with this uh, otter. And uh, what otter taught us really came handy in the entire flying career. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> Very nice. So after the otter, what did you, after? Uh... Yeah, uh, after otter, there was a cultural shock. I went straight to AN-32s, which was, I think, uh, 20, 30 times more speed. And <laughs> all the modern aviation uh, aids and uh, real big aircraft, capacity of 5, uh, five plus tons, 5.5 .5 tons or more. And... Uh, when I reached the squadron, I was posted to Agra by the way, in AN-32. So when I reached the squadron, I was B green on orders. So, but that time Sri Lanka Ops was going on. Uh -huh, okay. So my all squadron pilots along with the aircraft were there. So my commanding officer was my instructor who converted me to an 32 So I, my conversion was then very fast and my first category on an 32 it was a uh, sea green, so I was operational quite fast because of my uh, experience in otters. So otter really gave us a impetus, you can call it, uh, and mm -hmm. real. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, you know, if I can just ask you more about the AN32, and I know the AN32 that we procured was I think an operated because it had more powerful engines for high altitude operations. So just tell us something about the background of the aircraft. And and I remember as a child going into an AN-32 cockpit and being so pleasantly surprised by how spacious it was, how well laid out compared to, you know, of course, the AN-12s that one had seen before that were really very busy, very crowded. So just tell us more about the AN-32, sir. Definitely, and one of my favorite subjects, let me tell you that, <laughs> what you asked. I am in love with this aircraft and why you will uh, keep knowing as we move ahead, okay. Uh, it's a Russian rugged machine, okay, good speed, uh, very versatile aircraft. You know, the story goes that uh, Russians had AN-26 as the original aircraft. 
Ah, right. Hmm. But uh, you know, India, because of the diverse weather, diverse geography, the climatical conditions, we require an aircraft which can be operated at uh, minus uh, 20, and we require the same aircraft operating as plus 52. Right. And ah. then we require an aircraft which is operating in the coastal regions and without any rusting. So we require a quite of a multi-tasking kind of a machine. And uh, you'll be surprised to know that was provided to us by Russians by modifying the thing. You know, they could uh, increase the engine power so they, uh, and how to give a short landing and short takeoff uh, performance. So what they did is they lifted the engine and mounted on the above the wings. Okay. Uh -huh. That that is how the exhaust used to go in that a particular direction, and that used to give you that uh, V stall or whatever you call short takeoff and landing act. Uh, this thing. Okay. So this machine uh -huh. was purely made on demand for Indians. And what a human service it has given to uh, Indian Air Force. You know, it's a phenomenal aircraft which can do anything on in this world. And uh, uh, even the OEM, that is uh, original equipment uh, manufacturer, what the Antonov, what they said this machine cannot do, I got it done that also. So I, I was love uh, with this machine. And uh, N32 has really given, uh, you can call it a backbone, you know, uh, mid-level uh, load carrying capacity aircraft, if you consider N32 is the backbone and we have the number wise also we were much, uh, having much, much more. So this aircraft, when we have to replace, is going to be a big issue. Uh, C295 is coming up, appears to be quite okay. But let's see how it goes. But AM32, one of the most versatile machine. And let me tell you, not very easy to fly. Huh? So tell me about that. So what was it? Yeah, what was it like to fly? Yeah, the you know, the power, everything, whatever you asked, they gave you. The Russians gave you. Now, they didn't think of your comfort. So they said, you want a short takeoff? Here is an engine which you have mounted on the top. So then you are, you had to have some design changes at the uh, tail also. So they gave a ventral fin. Now all such things were added, subtracted, and that way the uh, you know aircraft had uh, different characteristics as uh, uh, compared to other stable aircraft like Avro uh, or Otter or things like that. You know the rudders, engine failure was a very difficult activity to handle. It required a lot of strength. You know. Uh, muscle power was the required power and uh, a very funny incident about N32 I'll tell when we, we, the new aircraft came in 1984 or so one of the aircraft was getting airborne from Delhi so this used to throw a lot of you know black soot or smoke a typical Russian machine so one the of the airliners quite characteristic huh? yes yes so one of the airliner was flying behind the chap so he asked him uh, Confirm uh, all normal. So the pilot was quite witty. So he said, yes, yes, all normal. We are on coal power. So you are finding <laughs> what you are finding. <laughs> Such was the, uh, you know, dark, very blackish suit is to leave behind. Because a lot of power. and it, it, so, But uh, uh, it served the purpose. That is what is the most important aspect of it. It served the purpose. Interesting. Mm -hmm. A lot of vibration in the aircraft. Yes, and, yes. Uh, I presume but, uh, you get used to it after a while, but it's still uh, supposed to be quite a thing. You said it. We got used to so much that when this aircraft was, uh, you know, done up a little bit, uh, a major uh, kind of uh, activity was done on this aircraft in which uh, reducing this noise level was also considered. So that time I, I was a CEO of the one of the unit. And that aircraft was allotted to me. So I was used to AN32, which made a lot of vibrations and a lot of noise. When you started the engine, also you knew that this thing has started. When I sat in this aircraft first time and I started the APU and the engines, I didn't come to know. So I was so uneasy, let me tell you. And without vibrations, I was not enjoying the aircraft at all. 
luckily or unluckily for few and luckily for chaps like me not all aircrafts were converted and few still uh, the original ones exist <laughs> Great, sir. So if we can come to um, maybe the landing at DBO, what was the, and I think you've done multiple such high altitude landings. So um, what was the, what was the task? How did you go about thinking and planning and executing it? What was that experience? Put us in the cockpit with you as if we were landing with you in the first time in DBO. Surely I will do that, but before that, DBO, I will I have, uh, I have to uh, mention a incident which changed my life. You know, till Wing Commander, I had a quite a okay sailing. I did FIS also after uh, very early as a flight lieutenant. And yeah, then, you have 3,500 uh, instructional yeah, hours, I think. Enjoyed yeah. the instructional hmm. tenure at AFA, that is Ambition Issue Training, for three years. One and a half years at Yalanka and then, of course, in Scotland. So after that, I went to staff college and post staff college, you know, you get choice posting from there. So I was asked where you will like to go. And I opted for Chandigarh because that was the only place in N32 I had not operated. I had operated on detachments, but otherwise not. And I was due for flight commander tenure. Right, right. So I told you decision making. Okay, so one side Sorry, sir, you know, what were the other options? I think Jorhat was a big one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Jorhat was a big one. Agra was once again there. Then we had uh, South one squadron. And in Jor uh, Jorhat, we had two that time. Choices were many. So in, in spite of DBO, I'll take you a step back. From Staff College, I was posted as Flight Commander to, uh, you know, Chandigarh on an AN-32 aircraft and, uh, you know, 1999, Cargill war was just over. I was posted in 2000, July or August. And during Cargill war, this uh, Cargill runway was not available. Mm -hmm. It was annoying and it was with civil people. Okay. It was manned by them. So as a flight commander, I was tasked by the Indian Air Force to get this airfield done up. In that, we had to do some resurfacing. Then there are uh, right in the middle of the runway, you know, one uh, uh, stream was flowing. So on that, they had to make some uh, bridge kind of a structure, strengthen it so that that becomes okay. So all this work was done and I did a trial landing somewhere in 2001. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a very tricky airfield, let me tell you. Uh, in short, it is a very, uh, it is 10,000 and above surrounded by very, very, very huge mountain ranges, very close to uh, LOC from Pakistan. And second thing is the approach that is finals to the runway. The distance is so less that you almost have to dive the aircraft. So the degree of difficulty of landing was there a lot. Anyway, I went there in a helicopter first tried out how to do a circuit, set a pattern, and did a trial landing, which was successful. There were certain more works required. So again, they did that. Again, I did one more somewhere in uh, April, May 2001. But thereafter, there were more works required, and there was a change of handing over of that airfield from civil to Air Force for, for reasons uh, which were uh, well known then. So what happened is uh, there was a lull. There was no landing done uh, at all. And somewhere in Feb 2002, I was told that now plan a sortie. In that sortie, uh, rather the date was 19th Feb 2002, I distinctly remember. Because it's a life-changing uh, incident which happened to me. When we were flying uh, uh, near the Kargil, how, when, with whom, what happened and all, we will leave the details, but I will tell you, a missile was fired upon my head. Oh my God. You know, oh. yeah, yeah, you are, you know, you are operating very close to the LOC. It is almost plus minus, you don't know which way, this way. So maybe we, they construed that we have, or maybe, but we were fired upon. Right? My goodness, okay. 
And so, sorry, sorry, just uh, take us back a little bit. So you were at what altitude and what did you see? In, what did you see? How did you know that a missile had been fired? Just Yeah, that's the best part of it. Actually, I told you missile was hit, but I will tell you if you want to know from inside the cockpit what is yes. happening. What if, what were you seeing? We, we, we must must have been you know slightly right of track and left of track in hills. It's uh, you know the navigation is eyeball contact, not much of navigational aid work, and it had snowed very badly. It was kind of a total whiteout uh, outside. Anyway, but uh, I saw Cargill town township to my left, whereas it should have been exactly 12 o'clock to us. So. As I saw it to be the left, I said, oh, we are to the right. And I put on bang to the left and I heard a thud. Hmm. And with that thud, a lot of uh, flashing of orange lights, red lights, some warnings started coming. Fire, fire, engine fire, all such warnings. The cockpit was lit up. My goodness. So what we thought in the cockpit is we had a bird it or the right engine has failed, cracked or something and fire is been spreading. So I told, I took the initial actions of uh, extinguishing the right engine fire, but, uh, and send my flight engineer running behind in the cargo compartment to have a look that uh, the fire is not spreading on the wing. But when he came back, he had a bad news. He said, yes, sir, there is a fire uh, engine and that fuel and oil is spreading on the wing and that is catching fire. But till he had gone and did, done this activity, I had done the final act of closing the low pressure pump also. High pressure pump I had closed, fuel, low pressure also I had closed. So now I told him again, go back and see. Sorry, just for the audience, sir, can you just explain what is that high pressure pump, low pressure pump? Uh... Yeah, to feed an engine, normally you have two pipelines, okay? Uh, at the different power setting, you require different fuel flow. So the amount of fuel going in, so you have a high pressure pump, you have a low pressure pump. For idle starting and all, you use the other one. For uh, higher requirement of fuel, you use the other one. So whenever there is a fire, you first thing you have to do is cut off your fuel supply. Fuel supply. That is the only way to stop because engine has got a fire extinguisher, but it is confined to only inner of the engine. Wing, wing fire also, extinguishers are also available, but they are fired in air, so they, are, they, they don't uh, have that much of uh, effect on the whole thing. Okay, so switching off fuel had saved our life. The flight engineer came and said, sir, now there is no fire. So I did all the actions of an engine failure. You have to feather the engine. Basically, uh, there should not be drag on that engine, so you feather the engine. You made the blade angle such that it just rotates but doesn't create any drag and then we turned left came over Cargill now landing at Cargill was impossible I told you very difficult to land with two engines here we were on an engine and that two a engine was out because of fire right right now sorry can I ask you um, you know in multi-engine operations we're used to the single engine ceiling and drift down altitude so what was the single engine ceiling of the an32 that that day for that day it was a uh, 15500 drift down altitude you can call it that is the height lowest you will come down when you are on a single engine. single engine okay and so the ridges around you must have been much higher than that yes right? yes so the uh, my transition and my uh, en, en route to lay was quite uh, happening. You know, we were almost hu hugging the hills at times. At times, you know, we have uh, something known as escape route, pre-designated escape route. In all these hill flying, we do designate because such things can happen. Pressurization failure can happen where you have to descend. Engine can fail where you have to descend. So we had a pre-designated route. Chosen valley through which you can then... Chosen valley. But then you are so tight uh, traveling through that valley because the mountain ranges are very close. You have to keep looking left wing, okay, right wing, okay. And on a single engine, as it is, your aerodynamic, uh, you know, goes haywire. So you are controlling the aircraft, doing all this. Somehow, with uh, through this uh, escape route, we reach Leh. I did a single engine landing at Leh. Maybe the first one. I am not very sure, but people do say 
it is the first one ever in hills that somebody has flown for 31 32 minutes and brought an aircraft back and after we landed the fun is now i call it fun now but that time it was a shock <laughs> You know, when we got down of the aircraft and I looked at the engine, mm. we came to know it was not a bird hit or some problem with the engine, but a missile had gone through and through in our engine. Wow. In the right engine. My goodness. Now, something about the missile. You know, the it is a shoulder-fired missile. It has got two fuses. One is proximity fuse. You know, basically, they are heat-seeking. You are... You are uh, People must be all aware about that. It is a heat seeking, so it goes toward the engine exhaust. Right. And what was the name of the missile? It's the Stinger or what is the... Yeah, Stinger. Stinger, Stinger, Stinger. is it? Okay, wow. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Pakistanis had those only that time. So we were sure that they have done the trick. Anyway, so that, uh, it had a proximity fuse and it has got an impact fuse. If the first fail, then the second, as it impacts, it bursts. And then there is no chance of surviving. With, uh, you know, Almighty's grace and uh, our good luck and destiny, the both the views fa failed. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. So you suffered a missile hit, but it didn't explode, is it? That was essentially No. Right? Otherwise, wow. it would have been the, the whole wing would have been uh, uh, out from the main uh, fuselage and we would have been nowhere. So... Like a projectile, you know, it had gone through and through the engine and finished off the engine, you know, from where it came out, there was a gaping hole of some uh, five, six feet and from where it entered, there was a hole of, you can say, uh, six inches, uh, 10 inches or something like that. Uh, and all oil and fuel was on the wing, but because of we had extinguished, we could survive and came back. So now, so now you know, uh, as in any organization, any incident, there are things to follow. Why, what, how, who to be blamed, everything. So I was busy in that for many, uh, you know, can say months together. And uh, it, it was there, there in very much in news uh, the, in 2002. Okay. So, uh, anyway. So, sorry, sir. I, I just want to, uh, you know, you had earlier mentioned the N32 is very difficult to fly on one engine. And can you yes, just explain yes. to the audience why a multi-engine aircraft is difficult to fly on one engine and how you fly yeah, it on one engine? Uh, you know, moment uh, some problem comes up with the engine, you, I told you there is, if the prop keeps rotating, there will be a lot of drag on that side. And then, Aircraft can be uncontrollable in such because vicious yaw and roll both takes place. Right, right. Because one engine is pulling and the other pulling engine is dragging. Pulling and other is wanting to take it back. So it is a vicious movement. So first thing you do is feather the engine, whichever is gone bad. Now movement you shut down and feather, now it becomes controllable. But you have to almost apply full rudder. And trim off fully and uh, apply aileron. So you are kind of a, your stick and everything is at a cockeyed angle, but you are traveling straight. That is how this circus is done. And the pressures on leg and your arms and all is quite a bit. And any power changes you make about the, with the live engine, the, it affects the aircraft aerodynamics quite a lot. So you have to do it very smoothly. Then you have to maintain height also with the available power. Then you are in the hills. So it's kind of a, a uh, difficult degree of difficulty is too high. Just to mention that. And uh, in plains, it is difficult to maintain. Here it was in hills for us. So it was absolutely. And landing also, you know, once you are on single engine, you have no choice. If you are on both the engines and you approach a runway and want to land, and suppose your parameters are not correct or not okay. You have always a choice to open both throttles, go around and come back again for a nice landing. In single engine, that is not possible because uh, uh, lay runway is 10,000 feet. Uh, already circuitized is 12,000 feet. At that height, maintaining going round was not possible. So, 
it is a must land situation so that is another stress or pressure or whatever you want to call it is there so you once a single engine and at that uh, circumstances and situations like that is in lay in the hill it was a kind of a difficult situation for us but we managed pretty well and landed the aircraft but then we saw this happening <laughs> Well, wow. so, so you know, airline pilots have a simulator where they can simulate this sort of situation, but I don't think in thirty two there was a simulator. So, how would you train for or practice for you know these sorts of single engine situations? Would you would you actually simulate it by shutting down an engine in flight and then fly it? And... We used to find a midway. You know, we didn't have simulator as you rightly said. So we used to do a lot of practice of this, uh, especially you are aware that uh, as you take off and you reach a certain height, that is the most critical portion of the flight if you have engine failure. Okay, so there we used to simulate by closing one throttle, not feathering, not feathering, closing one throttle and it used to be quite close to the real situation, not exact to the real situation, but even by closing itself, controlling that aircraft was a, you know, a kind of a fight with the aircraft. It was a Russian machine. That's why I say they are really meant for tough, tough guys. So we used to practice that way. And we used to actually feather in, you know, at a safe altitude. We used to fly 10,000, 15,000, feather the engine, full drill we used to do. We used to do fire drills also practice. So there was no simulator. So this was a compulsory thing for us. We had a schedule meant for that to practice uh, the engine failures. And that way we used to train. Even in circuit, we used to train. Right. And just one last thing, you know, I want to clarify for the audience. In these situations, you can't use autopilot or anything of that sort. You're flying it completely manual, all. right? Yes, it's not at all. Because this aircraft, uh, I told you, instability is, uh, you know, uh, by birth, you can say, because the engines were brought up, they tried uh, compensating with the uh, ventral fin and things like that. But still, it had that little bit of, uh, you know, instability. So, for because of that, autopilot was not. And you know, let me tell you, for civil pilots, uh, what autopilots you have, Russians don't make such autopilots. Right. <laughs> <laughs> autopilots are also uh, pretty very basic. Uh, you know? Yeah, very, very basic. So, in normal two-engine thing also, the autopilot uh, used to keep going left and right. So, in single engine, I, engaging that was out of question. So, all manual. All Fantastic. Manual. Amazing, sir. Amazing. Now, coming back to DBO, sir, what is the... Now that uh, I was a uh, flight commander in this place and I had this incident, uh, somehow, as a captain of the aircraft, of course, I, I was responsible. So whatever had to happen, happened. But I was brought back as flight commander again because they uh, came to the conclusion that it was not my, my mistake as such and things were uh, so settled down. However, thereafter, uh, I had gone through a lot of stress and strain. So, I came to my hometown, Nagpur, did a nice NCC tenure. And uh, I reached Agra as a coup, chief operation officer. I was posted to Agra after my incident, though I was blamed for the thing and all. They said, all oh, okay, you go back. The, that is the, that was the biggest, uh, that is the biggest base in Asia. It's a huge station. And we had all a uh, lot of strategic assets there and wonderful tenure. Chief operation officer, I had wonderful tenure and I was most happy to do one job there. You know, in uh, Air Force, we had a fighter combat leader. We have helicopter combat leader. But nobody thought that there can be combat role for transport also. Ah, uh -huh, right. And I being a hardcore <laughs> by choice transport pilot, I always used to think about this. Ki why not? There are so many things the transport aircraft can do. It can do para drop, it can do, you know, surprise drop, it can do free fall, it can do bombing, it can do assault landings, so many things. So why not a transport combat leader? So, you know, initially I put across this point, 
not agreed to initially, maybe for uh, right reasons. So I did one localized one and showed them, no, it will be of use. And I was so happy that they approved of a transport combat leader during my coup tenure. And the first course was under me. Fascinating. As a chief operation officer. And that passed out in December that year. Somewhere in August, I got a, uh, you know, uh, posting to East once again mm -hmm. as a commanding officer. Right. Uh -huh. So I had done already two tenures, one uh, in Chabua, one in Jorad, almost amounting to seven years or so plus. So, you know, I thought, why me? I have done a flight commander tenure in Chandigarh, maybe Chandigarh, or if not, then I can go to Sulur and operate in Andaman and Nicobar and things like that. I wanted something different. So I put up an application and told them, uh, I don't think I should be going to East. There are many people who have not. So please re reconsider. And to my surprise and shock, in, in two minutes interview with the boss of the HR, it was agreed to. Okay. Uh -huh. And he told me, you are absolutely correct. You should not be going there. We will cancel. <laughs> I was posted as CEO to Chandigarh once again. Uh -huh. Okay. The same squadron where you were the flight commander, is it? No, now I was in a different squadron. I was earlier in uh, one squadron which was IL AN32 combined. Now I was in a AN32 independent squadron as a commanding officer. Uh -huh. So uh, I reached there. So uh, people, uh, locals were very happy that he is the same guy who had a trouble in uh, Kargil. But look at Air Force. And I really appreciate Air Force for that. That they send me back as a boss of a squadron on which uh, aircraft I had a problem because they believed in my, uh, you know, capabilities and I'm very thankful for a very, very nice chance they gave me. And here started the DBO. You know, when I was a flight commander, DBO is a place, let's, uh, our people know who are listening to us, it is in Eastern Ladakh. Right. Okay. It is just six kilometers east of the line of actual control oh. that is with China. <laughs> right. And it is around 12 kilometers south east of that LOC. Okay. And Karakoram Pass is just about 10 kilometers as the profile. Wow. I never realized it was that close. <laughs> yes. It is a very, very strategically important place where almost five borders of the five nations meet and not only that five cultures are also there established persian chinese indian uh, central indian all so that, that is a very important place it is known as roof of the world because it's the highest point from where you can you can see that uh, so strategically very important just so uh, you know uh, west of uh, aksai chin area which china had taken over and uh, to the north is uh, Saksham Valley, which Pakistan has exited to China. So very, very strategically important. And geographically, one of the most difficult terrain, the airfield is located at 16,700 feet, the highest airfield in the world. It is surrounded by mountains, 22,500 to 23, 24, that way. And it forms a kind of a bowl. And the base of the bowl, base of the bowl is the runway. Oh. So you, you can imagine how one operates at such place. Right. So this was the reason. And most important thing was as a flight commander, I had dropped. We used to do drop sorties. You know, in uh, uh, all these northern regions are air maintained throughout the year. It is another uh, beautiful thing of uh, which a lot of Indians don't know. The entire north sector is air maintained by Indian Air Force. That means everyday ration, ammunition, clothing, fuel, everything goes there. Let me tell you, around 50,000 tons is dropped every year. It's a peacetime task, you can imagine. <laughs> so it's a kind of a bridge, aerial bridge between north and Chandigarh. So, where there are airfields, there were only two airfields when I joined. That is Thois and Leh. Thois and Leh. Uh -huh. So we used to land there and drop the load. And other places everywhere, we used to do drops. That is the rear ramp of the aircraft was opened. 
the load was kept on you know planks the planks were kept on a wheels rollers and you used to open the door pull the aircraft and the load used to go out of the aircraft and a parachute used to open and it used to fall at the designated place so that was the drop and the remotest place was supplied like that so we used to do drops in my flight commander the tenure at dbo sorry sir you know just uh, when you're saying it's a bowl so how would you what was the route in which you would run in drop and then how would you turn and climb out and that sort of thing and what altitude above the ground are you at typically during such a drop what we used to do is we used to drop at 1000 feet but the turns were so tight because of re, uh, remaining within the confine of the bowl almost certain times we used to reach uh, uh, 35 to 40 degrees of back. wow <laughs> that was the degree of difficulty for drop drop direction was quite okay because it was kind of a open area but when we used to, we had to finish the drop and turn because you have to take the para bags in close the ramp and turn otherwise the drag is more okay uh -huh. so it was a kind of a kind of a circus you can call it everything used to happen very fast and uh, we used to drop load and many places in siachen also there are many places like this where we used to drop degree of difficulty is pretty high and when you open the ramp the temperature outside is minus 30 you are on you are on oxygen pilot co pilot flight engineer the drop people who drop everybody is on oxygen and it is kind of a you know exercise after which you used to really get tired so that is the time when i used to drop at dbo i used to see some markings there so my curiosity brought me to see what these markings are when i landed as a flight commander only i had seen that there was a runway there earlier in 1962 a packet had landed there right 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 uh -huh. a packet with three engines had landed there and then they didn't continue because you know at 16700 feet if you switch off the engine it cannot restart because the maximum uh, elevation at which you can do that trick is around 13000 so no engine in the world is made to start after that all everybody knows because of the uh, rarefied atmosphere lesser oxygen within that amount of air so the engine doesn't start so that is why somehow 43 years nobody attempted anything there there was another problem you know that runway is not like any other runway it is not a bitumen surface it is it is mud surface because there is no road no railway line how do you take the bitumen and the material which for mm, making the right runway? right right mm. so they used to just compact a mud surface and that is what the runway was secondly there was you know uh, up the bowl the hills were around were so high that you had to decide on a point that beyond which you can't go wrong means committed to land was one height for us So above above airfield thousand and two thousand uh, five hundred feet was our we had kept that so that because the, there was a hill right in front so you could not have crossed and come out of that bowl if you had a single engine failure so that is how the, the degree of difficulty and the worst part have was have, what happened is in nineteen ninety six there was an earthquake there and there was a crevasse of almost fifteen feet wide and. Uh, 50 to 75 feet long right in the middle of the runway holy cow wow. <laughs> so nobody wanted to do that job because you can imagine uh, army jawans or uh, whoever wanting to work at 16700 feet it is almost a impossible task however when i came back as a ceo my boss was coming to chandigarh and uh, a great person i will name him here I, a excellent leader air marshal pk barbara is his name mm -hmm. right he was a leader to the core you know and i was waiting for an opportunity to work under such officer when he came to Ch chandigarh for his first visit i took over uh, chandigarh as ceo on 1st jan 2008 Air Marshal Barbara fortunately took over as AOC Western Air Command on 1st Jan 2008. <laughs> Coincidence, we both both took over by uh, respective places on the same day. And in Feb 
and in feb he was at my uh, station and in my squadron to get familiarized so this is the time i proposed him the dbo landing because it was in my mind back of mind always and i knew if somebody who is going to clear that is going to be this officer very gutsy very gutsy person very outspoken and very very good leader fascinating ha huh? yeah i they presented him told him the proposal told him the difficulties many difficulties aircraft difficulties runway you know then uh, diplomatic because china will make you and cry so there were lot of problems but after listening to my presentation in which i had highlighted that all the operations are going to be outside the performance graph of oem so there are no graphs for 16700 feet landing now uh, now you extrapolate means draw them further where it goes nobody can tell you they may flatten they may go up they may go outside nobody knows when we asked the russian they said don't do that we will not guarantee anything however that is why i say it was borbora sir because of whom it could happen i presented in my presentation itself he said please go ahead plan out come to command and explain us everything and we will go ahead and do a landing there so sir for the audience who don't know what you mean by these graphs i think you know the performance graphs that show how much runway distance you need to land how much runway distance you need to take off what climb rate you will get all those stop much lower than the altitude right yes that's correct and there are the temperatures the altitude then the runway length available then the true air speed it changes with that place the radius of turn there are many many factors which and even the braking speed the wheel brake speed also is designated correct because of higher speed the, yeah. Yeah. yeah you land at a very high ground speed almost 80 kilometers more than what you normally land 80 kilometers so it is a phenomenal activity you know lot of uh, risk factor was there but it was a military requirement basically so for this military requirement my boss was ready so in month of april i remember distinctly i went to the command and gave a presentation so there was a aviation expert sitting there there were technical experts sitting there there were soil experts sitting there there were army representatives sitting there and me i was the junior most chap sitting there because they were these all branches were represented by a higher ranking officers with in, in chair was air marshal borbora and that was the most soothing thing for me <laughs> <laughs> so aviation expert said that we uh, three uh, air vice marshals have done three board of officers and said an 32 cannot land there and they were right because what the things we just discussed it is outside graph means the runway length is not sufficient and uh, temperatures are not very the thing the pressures that places are not the radius of turn so all they said what they were saying is right then the soil expert said the soil there is such that it is not giving the desired soil strength for a aircraft to land i think 1.25 or something something is the value even if you compact they said that it may not be possible and the technical people were right by saying that oem has put a, a ban on operating means starting this engine above 135 you can't uh, switch off the engine and start so we said okay we will keep it running but they said if it uh, goes uh, uh, some problem comes up then if it switches off then what you will you will have to leave the aircraft there i said yes that is a risk so all these people said no 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 then i got up borbora sir said explain them why you want to do so i explained that it is outside the graph this that but the strategic importance is such that this will come handy one day <laughs> and it is a good thing our people the army jawans who were stationed there used to take 15 days in summer to come to thois walking and in winter they never used to come then how do you do casualty evacuation because helicopters could carry only one to two passengers because of that altitude so i said for our jawans morale also it is required then we used to 
do keep doing drop sorties. If engine fails there, we can't come out. Then we can at least put down the aircraft is uh, if it is uh, available. So all these reasons were given, and uh, I said militarily it is a requirement, and strategically also for the country it will be a good thing. So lastly, after all the briefings, Air Marshal Vorvora asked me, Chafikar, are you sure it can be done? I still remember distinctly, and I said yes, sir. And in he took just 30 seconds to get up from his seat and say. We are going ahead with DBO landing. Planning will be done by him, and date will be decided. And we are going ahead. And he My was goodness! Wow. <laughs> so I consider him the leader. You know, when you have to do certain certain things which are not easily possible, you require right people at the right places. So thereafter, army did a backbreaking activity. They compacted the entire runway, entire runway, 8,000, 9,000 feet. There were no center line because it is mud. So with, with white tuna, they made center line. Then there were no distance to go markers. You know, when you land on a runway, how much runway is left it gives you confidence. So you have 1,000 feet, 2,000 feet. There are markers like this in all runways you could see. Here, there was no such thing. So, on jerry cans, they painted it white. On jerry cans, they wrote this. And jerry cans were my distance to go markers. They, they put a lot of oil, a lot of water on the surface so that the dust doesn't rise. And before that, of course, the crevasse which was there was to be filled up by them. They filled it up. And really, hats off to the army jawans. Only they can do such job at 16,700 feet, nobody else. So, so that was one another element which I had decided, come what may, we will do this. Now that my boss has cleared it, a lot of difficulties, still we will be doing this. And the date decided was 31st May 2008. We got airborne very early because we wanted to land in the, you know, uh, temperature which are conducive to landing. And uh, Air Marshal Barbara was in the aircraft oh, as wow. passenger because he wanted to be there uh, to see how we do the things. And uh, really, it, uh, our morale was up because of that and he didn't ask for VIP seats as normally people think. He was sitting on a normal seat where Jawans sit. Okay, there's a beautiful photograph with me about that. And that is how I called him a true leader, you know, where this, what is required, what is important, where the execution of this landing was important. He didn't bother about his uh, comforts and things like that. So, on 31st, we landed there. Sorry, so you got airborne from um, Chandigarh? We got airborne from Chandigarh, Chandigarh. Okay. And how did you, you calculate know, how much fuel and, uh, yes, and how, how many another, people did you have on board? Uh, yeah, so I just yeah. love to hear those details. And then, of course, just describe the sortie to us. What was the day like? What yeah. was the weather like? Sure, sure. You know, these, uh, all these things which you are talking about took a lot of time of mind. You know, I had to simulate the conditions which are at uh, DBO at Chandigarh and try out landings like that. Rate of descent high, higher higher landing speeds, everything we tried out at Chandigarh. I was given clearance to do that because simulating those conditions here in an actual aircraft was difficult. You are almost on a kind of a flapless approach for where what? There it is full flaps. But anyway. That was done. Then uh, we uh, prepared for all eventualities. You know, if aircraft goes, a best aircraft was selected. Time and again, a lot of additional checks were done on tires, the engine mountings, and we made sure that the aircraft should not go unserviceable there. My technical staff was at it almost for 20 to 30 days. We selected two aircrafts which were good. Then we had almost taken out everything from the aircraft to reduce the all of the weight. 
minimize the weight. Only one seat was kept for Marshal Barbara and that was very lightweight. We had only the crew which is required and nobody additional was taken. And those additional checks I told you were kept uh, for the safety of the aircraft so that the aircraft should not go unserviceable at DBO was the main aim. And we took off almost uh, 440, 450 in, in the morning. It was night flying for us. Got airborne and we saw sunrise over Himalayas only. And a beautiful sight. It was, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, the, uh, the excitement was right from the briefing. Because when they, my squadron people saw that uh, CNC is there, the AOC is there, it was different from them. The we history is being uh, made. Do, yeah, and we used to do early morning takeoff. It is not new to Chandigarh. But that day with so many dignitaries around, and let me tell you one thing, we had kept it need to know basis. Very few knew that we are going to do this. Okay. Yes, because, uh, you know, Ch Chinese yeah, uh, I didn't want any reaction, this, if it doesn't work, so we had kept uh, this, and we had a problem in Cargill, so I had requested that we keep this need to know, so my technical staff knew, my pilots knew, I knew CNC and all, but rest, Indian Air Force didn't know that we are attempting something like that. So, uh, reaching, uh, weather was okay that day. Did you have anybody on the ground there who was, you know, relaying, say, the local altimeter setting, weather conditions, wind direction, anything of that sort? Actually, whatever you talk about uh, DBO, na, there is a bunch of new thing, uh, funny thing crops up. Now, altimeter. You know, we the altimeter there means what is the elevation was an issue there. When helicopter leads to land, it used to show 16,500 sometimes. When we used to do drop and calculate, it used to show 16,700 sometimes. So finally, we made a decision that let's keep it 16,600 as an average thing. Because whatever instrument we were taking there, it was not giving an accurate thing. Because of the rarefied atmosphere and things like that, it was not giving that. So that was the kind of a... Uh, you know, med facilities or help from the local was available. It was kind of a, there was no ATC, there was no med. However, we put at, uh, we had put our med assistant there and uh, he used to tell us, but accuracy was a problem, definitely a problem. Okay, so that also we had catered for by keeping, you know, a selection of altimeter uh, at one certain point only where we had done earlier. I had done few circuits there, you know. Uh, moment I say I have done circuits, I remember of one more very, very interesting part. When uh, uh, Air Marshal Borbora cleared me to land, uh, that you go ahead, we will land at DBO. So what I used to do as flight commander, I used to take an aircraft, do a drop sortie. After drop, the aircraft will be, used to be empty. Right, right. So this empty aircraft I used to select undercarriage down and try out a approach on the runway. Not go down below that uh, uh, decision height, but till there at least I, so we started knowing that this is the best place to set altimeter. This is the speed which we should maintain. This is the circuit pattern we should fly. This so is we the had prepared. picture that you'll get. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But one problem was there, you know, everything, there was an issue. The Chinese woke up. They said they have a DZ here and they do drop sorties. Now, why this one aircraft which comes in two days once or something like that puts its undercarriage down? So <laughs> wow, they were there observing was a lot of all that. Hmm. Yes, they were monitoring everything. There was a lot of discussion on this subject on the Chinese internet and their other sources. Okay, so they knew that there is something, but they didn't know when and why and what they are doing. So that was the preparation. Everything was tried out, done, but that accuracy you can't say was phenomenal, you know. But we do we did have an idea about what to do. So that day, the weather was kindly, uh, you know, quite okay till you can say 
abim cart so lake and things like that but there after there was one layer at 20000 feet also and we were maintaining around 22 to 24000 feet but i had already gone three four times there and you know we had taken one more precaution there was another aircraft above me means uh, earlier behind me following me and when i descended over dbo through that cloud layer there was another aircraft hovering above me for two three things number one they wanted to shoot the landing so that it can be used for training purpose then they they were keeping a watch across the lac that there is nothing tried out no tricks are done by the chinkies and so that one aircraft was above me and we made an approach for runway 11 uh, you know uh, it was a kachcha runway unpaved so it was not as flat as any they had done compacting but there were still bumps so the touchdown was smooth however thereafter the ride was slightly bumpy okay but it was fun filled because uh, this bumps only tell you that you have done something very <laughs> unique and different <laughs> and you are not landing on a normal uh, smooth runway mm. technique wise were you using you know any different techniques from what you would normally do to no i i tell you technique wise what we did is all speeds were higher you know so we were going on ground speeds which were higher circuit if we maintained 250 all the while here we were maintaining uh 300 plus okay then on finals we were maintaining a constant speed and started reducing much later not as we did earlier at 300 feet and below and the touchdown speed itself was 280 km which is our flapless speed in normal circumstances and here we were full flat so you know the attitude touchdown attitude was slightly different it gave a different feel you know you are moving at that speed with full flap is a different feel in itself but the runway length was okay so we didn't have to break in a hurry or something like that but when we started breaking the effectiveness was not that as good as other runways because that of the friction uh, mm-hmm. did you use reverse thrust or did you no we don't uh, we we, you... uh, we have what we uh, withdraw from propeller, propeller. Ah. yeah so reversible propeller we did use but late slightly late because we wanted to see the how it uh, reacts on that surface but the uh, popping was not a major issue okay you know, we we've, we've seen a video of the c130 landing there and so tremendous amount of dust that gets kicked up and yes you yes, know yes. did you experience the same thing when you landed yeah it is more to tell you the it is more during uh, take off than during landing okay c130 has got a problem of four engines and they are uh, you know counter rotating kind of a things they have so the way they suck up the uh, dust is different than a n32 n32 prop move in the same direction in that case it is in a half so you they have the more problem on landing also and take off also but take off it is behind the aircraft so it doesn't matter much but for us also for take off that the is to throw a lot of dust and that dust used to remain for 10 minutes plus wow you know so much of dust <laughs> okay great so then the aircraft came to a stop you turned around we stopped then we lined up for you know all these uh, people army uh, johnnies who had done this back breaking job we had taken a lot of sweets for them and there was shabashi all around Uh, the army commander who was uh, the boss that time uh, general bharadwaj was also on ground he had come by a helicopter his role was very important because because of his leadership that airfield could be done up and uh, you can imagine when i used to go i'll tell you another thing why i say it is so difficult when i used to go for inspection in a helicopter they used to keep the rotors running because uh, hardly any time they could stop you know for all of it the fuel taken was bare minimum 5 minutes all that's all so i used to go for inspection i used to get into a jeep that jeep maximum speed used to be 5 km to 10 km per hour oh ho very fine atmosphere right right my goodness so then i used to prefer to walk 
so for second or third day i particular the touch down area i wanted to check so i barely to four to five step fast you know quickly i will see and there i could feel the dizziness due to lack of oxygen luckily a uh, jawan was standing as uh, walking along with me with a mask and the uh, oxygen, oxygen cylinder wow because you had been acclimatized right uh -huh. yeah because we were not acclimatized from chandigarh we used to straight come there whereas the boys there this army jawans who were stationed there were so acclimatized that their base from runway where they used to live was almost around 2 kilometers away they used to run from there when they used to hear my aircraft noise and come to the airfield to man it run such tough boys there and they did a phenomenal job so they were there was uh, thanksgiving all around because of their good job and then we after 5 minutes engines were not to be switched off so engine were running there were one extra pilot we had carried he was sitting in the cockpit so we got into the aircraft and got airborne now airborne there was a issue you know the asi that is air speed indicator registers very late ha uh ha -huh, correct mm. <laughs> very bright atmosphere that is going to take that initial time so your heart almost comes in your mouth that why this thing is not registering <laughs> luckily we were aware of it we were prepared for it still it gave us missed our heartbeat one that hope everything is going normal but then the asi started registering then we uh, you know you to unstick also it's a bumpy ride basically you are you are getting shaken up uh, all over in that bumpy ride we unsticking is also you don't know how clean it is you know and after unsticking there is a, another uh, huge hill right in front so you have to immediately turn right so you have to select flaps immediately turn right reduce the drag and turn right and then in a orbit you climb up and then set course so the other aircraft which was on the top we have done a nice video clipping and we did lot of training based on that clip because uh, thereafter i did lot of sorties cleared lot of pilots there because you know uh, orbora sir was such a leader which i already uh, had anticipated that once i do trial landing he is not going to stop at trial mm correct obviously <laughs> so moment we finish trial he said chafekar let's take some load in now let's get this boys out and but he gave lot of freedom to me that i to decide how much to load take in installments increase but then we did almost 50 60 sorties in my tenure itself and uh, we establish the entire standard operating procedures and you know uh, one other very unusual incident after we landed at uh, dbo and took off we had taken minimum fuel you were asking about fuel na? we had taken fuel from chandigarh to dbo and dbo to thois dbo to thois okay so little and we were to refuel in thois because if we had taken more fuel then landing weight would have been a issue so as we got airborne for thois and landed at thois we got a information that of chinese have asked for a flag staff meeting please. flag meeting oh my goodness <laughs> that quickly is it amazing that quickly <laughs> oh. but interesting part comes thereafter as quickly they called for one they cancelled immediately <laughs> and they did thrice you know why because they also would have thought what to ask them dbo is in our area it is our airfield we are doing our activity within our this thing but all these years because they may have some issues we were not going to following that path and once we did that is how it very clearly shows that you have to go ahead and do things the repercussions and this may not be as bad as you think it may be in your mind you know they call for three meetings such and all the three times they called it off that was the most fun part of it and there was no objection there after and then we they kept going there 50 plus sorties and here in the flow i will like to tell you what we didn't understand then the strategic importance we understood in 2020 when uh, chinese put all their soldiers there in uh, eastern ladakh 
we had to pump in our people that is the time dbo airfield helped the hercules aircraft took lot of people did lot of sorties and we could induct our troops also and that is why the status quo could be managed so what we thought in 2008 actually came true and practically was known to the whole world in 2020 so when you do out of box thinking at times maybe the results will not be immediate but they do so i had retired till then but then then onwards dbu again came in li- uh, limelight mm-hmm. i can say <laughs> understood <laughs> amazing so say so you also did a few more which is uh, neoma and fukche where where are these and what are they like uh, they are little lower altitude but uh, were there any unique difficulties in these yeah i i you, you know i had a wonderful lot working under me my squadron pilots were so enthusiastic so devoted so much of enthusiasm i have never seen in my life and i that is why i fully believe you give a cause to the youngsters and they readily accept it and they give their full to you so when i did dbo they said sir uh, uh, eight ten days newspapers everywhere covered everything and it's over now what let's look for something else and because of this youngsters i pulled out a map one day in a briefing hall put the whole squad in there and started looking for places and that is the time we found something known as fukchi now fukche airfield is in you know uh, now the pengam so lake is in news and galwan is in news south of galwan and south of pengam so lake in the uh, so that sind river indus river next to indus river is this runway which is at 14500 elevation and the best part of this area is the eastern bank of the river is with india and the western bank of the river uh, sorry other way round western bank is with india and eastern bank is with china so you know uh, because of the lot of uh, halla gulla which was created after dbo chinese asking for flag me this that the permission from government was coming late anyway we went ahead with the you know preparation because lot of preparation was to be done this runway was also not used at all there was a water tank uh, very close to the runway the surface was bad so we had to compact so all that we had started till then within a month we got a clearance so may uh, 2008 we did uh, dbo and in november we did fukche and this was slightly easier as i told you the common factors were uh, unpaved runway very close to uh, line of actual control surrounded by hills and uh, because of uh, elevation the degree of difficulty but this being in a river bed the circuit was over the hills but the approach and all was quite steady and nice and it was a cake walk after dbo but again bumpy ride both for landing and take off and uh, here also a very you know unique incident happened now the chinese knew that there is something going to happen to fukchena because i used to do trials with landing garage right, and right, 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 right. so yeah. they have put almost every inch of their bank soldiers with their personal vehicles they were lined up facing the indian side now we were not very sure whether they are oh, means trying to uh, it was a show of force or they wanted to actually see whether they actually do or they are just declaring war after the other so possible <laughs> but they saw full our landing and take off and then they withdrew in the evening it seems the people say they informed us so the entire people were watching when we were landing there but uh, there after this i feel have not been used like the way i landed in dbo and did lot of operations here there was no much requirement but we proved a point that, Proof that it in crisis we will be able to use this so that was how pukche went and i had taken an entire different crew now you know you these small little things do matter yeah, when you are trying to uh, uh 
uh, raise the morale of the squadron. Those, uh, the co-pilot who was there, the navigator and the flight engineer who was there for DBO, they were not repeated. This time I took an entire new set. I was the only common point. Yeah. And everybody is enthusiastic to do something very new, very unique. So that is uh, Fukche's story. Uh, people, people used to feel the name wise also very different and it had its own uh, charm, but um, much, you can say, much easier and much uh, comfortable than uh, DBO. Mm, DBO, wow. Amazing. So we've, uh, can we shift gears to some of the flood relief, the Yemen evacuation? What are some of your experiences? Yeah, definitely, there? but uh, in passing, you know, I will tell you about uh, Neoma because why it was required, you know, in this Indus Valley, there is a valley going towards lake from Indus Valley. It goes via Neoma. So, you know, the biggest uh, place in uh, Himalayas or uh, in our north region is lake. So any, uh, you know, adversary wanting to do anything there, will, lay will be the most. So we wanted to have a, you know, a field in between from Indus to lay in between. That is how Neoma came to be. It was at 13,500 feet, very close to a river. But here we had a problem. The, you know, soil was sandy. So what we could do at uh, DBO and uh, Fukche, we couldn't do here. So army used their uh, jugad and they added one, uh, you know, cement-like material to that sand. How interesting. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. And it was, you know, unpaved only, but the sand was holding now. That is how we landed there. And this landing was done somewhere in, uh, you know, uh, September 2009. So in 17 months, because of my youngsters, Josh and enthusiasm, they made me work out and do landings at three airfields. And we restarted these three airfields, which are of utmost strategic importance. And as I told you, the commonity was unpaved surface, High elevation, closer to the line of actual control. Right. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah, I can see them on the map, and they're all really very, very strategically located. Oh. Now that you have mentioned map, I will tell you another interesting thing. When I did landing in 2008, when you used to have a look at the map of this area, you know, there were only two places mentioned. Lay and Thois. That's all. But 2008 changed everything. Now, Lay, DBO was shown more prominently on maps than Lay and uh, Thois in all discussions of all the different forces for that matter. So we brought these places once again on map can be said to be the uh, impact. <laughs> So can we change gears to humanitarian assistance, disaster relief? You know, the Air Force has really Surely. done some amazing work in that area. And you were personally involved with Uttarakhand flood relief, the Yemen evacuation. So um, just tell us what were those experiences like? When did the call come? What, uh, what did we do? You know, Whenever, uh, you know, the role of uh, Indian Air Force primary is uh, guarding the skies of the country. However, helicopters and transport have got an additional task. That is peacetime task. That is humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. You know, this, as I told you earlier also, the air maintenance as it is, is there, which is 24-7-365. And it's a huge amount. To add to that, these two tasks also are around. Any calamity anywhere in the country, definitely the wherever the Air Force is required, the helicopters and transports are uh, means respond immediately. Now I'll tell you a very interesting thing. I was after my uh, you know CO tenure, I went to air headquarters and the uh, place which controls the transport and helicopters. 
so i was initially director of transport and helicopters and then i became the uh, principal director of helicopters and transport after becoming a air commodore right right so in my office my tv used to be on with volume zero you will be surprised to know that before anything could happen any uh, information used to come from the government or from the air force i used to be mentally prepared for the activity seeing on the tv that there is flood in so and so area i used to straight away tell my boys those those cordons be ready there is something to come so we always could anticipate and such a simple method we had adopted i will give you an example when nepal earthquake happened i first saw it on tv only that nepal uh, uh, has been hit by an earthquake which is very massive straight away I, what i did is picked up my phone and told the hercules squadron stand by one aircraft because they were giving uh, information thereafter that one of the uh, means the main kathmandu runway may also be damaged mm -hmm. now i had made them stand by they have loaded up with few things and they had to do a landing to check up whether the runway is okay for landings or not because nobody was going there so now mea got involved it is a very tricky activity going to a other country you know you have to have clearances you have to have air defense clearances you have to have uh, ministry of external affairs clearances you have to have ministry of defense clearances and the way system works it does take time but because i had told them earlier that we stand by and when the decisions came they were already in the cockpit strapped up to go mm, right and before the chinese or the us could respond indian aircraft was touching down at kathmandu and it was considered a big thing the full runway was not available so they used the whatever runway was available then reported the whole situation there then the repair works and thereafter the unprecedented task of you know helicopters and transport started the sub supply of rations the scheduled evacuations everything started thereafter but in this game of who goes first this is the way we could beat the topmost people because of being proactive on a by simple method so that was very handy so this one incident uh, tells me about this and as i was telling you yemen uh, yemen was a difficult task because gathering people at yemen itself when this uh, fight was going on was difficult so the local local uh, embassy people really did a good job mm -hmm. secondly we had to you know decide about the routes to follow and be ready for any eventuality and uh, flying times are very uh, means uh, we have to cater for two crew things like that so planning from uh, you know from newspaper it appears one aircraft has gone to yemen however the activity behind that which takes place is phenomenal the amount of work these people put through the air force the air headquarters the commands the squadrons it is very very interesting to know and these things have to fall in place at the right time then only at the right uh, time you can take people up and we evacuated yemen evacuation is one of the means uh, must mention evacuation because the speed and uh, the uh, number of people we could evacuate was phenomenal and uh, the, we were the only ones who could have done that time and that was uh, seen again in many other places thereafter also the uh, philippines we helped out we had helped out uh, you know uh, our neighbors also when there was a water crisis in our neighborhood we had taken more, even water tankers so such humanitarian help and disaster relief is a quite a major thing that is why i am always used to uh, call uh, you know transport and helicopter fleet the face of indian air force yeah, in no. calamities <laughs> very true mm. it is can be said to be so and uh, it gives immense pleasure let me tell you uh, for this i will tell you a casualty evacuation activity which happened uh, when i was a commanding officer 
you know uh, that is also comes under uh, humanitarian assistance only but only when this is when i was a ceo you know the in thois uh, there were some casualties young boys of army because of some uh, uh, skirmishes with the pakistanis they had a lot of uh, you know injuries head injuries splinter rather splinter injuries and things okay like uh -huh. and it was a sunday so we have a we have a methodology of keeping a aircraft standby on sunday for casualty evacuation because that is a must activity so that day weather i saw it was not very conducive for the crew who was detailed you know if it was cloudy overlay and toys descent would have been problem so i changed the crew and got myself into the cockpit because if it was a normal day air maintenance day we would not have done such was the weather but this was a requirement because of 20 casualties and uh, immediate evacuation was required so uh, it was a sos so we got aboard till lay and thois the weather weather started deteriorating when we reached over a thois there was a layer over thois and you know in the hills descending without having contact with the ground is not very mm, scary yeah <laughs> so we uh, in our normal route through the valley we couldn't descend because of cloudy now we reach over it we couldn't descend without uh, because of cloud anyway we decided to orbit for some time and luckily we saw a few patches opening and so could see the runway so kind of a spiral descent we did literally spiraling down we landed kept the engines running these boys were boarded you know they were uh, sedatives were given to them because they were in uh, agony and you know you have to keep the head injury uh, casualties when you carry you have to keep the pressure in the of uh, aircraft entire well balanced so that there is no too much of variation otherwise they that affects these people so the doctor came and briefed me about the patient told me that morphine had been given but still this pressurization and things like that so we closed the ramp and i lined up to our utter disgust the weather again packed up because now we require a clearance to climb up to climb through right mm -hmm. yeah so again we waited on the runway for 10 minutes the fuel was less so i decided to go back to this person but i didn't switch off and started waiting for the getting some clear patch that time the doctor walked into the cockpit and he tells me sir do you know all these guys blood pressure is settling down he said do you know the reason sir in this uh, sedation also they are well aware that they are been boarded on a aircraft now n32 noise is so familiar they are that they know they have been boarded that means they are they going hope. to chandigarh mm. Mm -hmm. now that hope has lightened up and they he says sir i am surprised that why i came to tell you that their blood pressures and all the other parameters are showing positive but i told him we are not airborne we are on tarmac and the weather doesn't appear he said don't worry sir that, that hope which has you have created itself is going to hold them luckily we got a patch we got climbed up landed at uh, chandigarh chandigarh the ambulances were ready they were immediately taken and you know when you do such things you are very involved with the whole thing next day along with my wife i went to the uh, ch okay in cvs i went just to meet these people i wanted to see that have my efforts given some fruitful result i was very keen you know sleepless night i had and to to our happiness almost all the guys survived my goodness wow and uh, we didn't mention them that i was the pilot or nothing uh, because their uh, faith on the an32 is so much built up there because they know in crisis these helicopters this transport aircraft will definitely come so to keep the morale up of the people posted there is the big job for uh, chandigarh and i am uh, a very very you know a uh, privileged uh, officer of indian air force who was posted at chandigarh as a flight commander commanding officer and air officer commanding three tenures i had and mind you i had no personal requirement uh, but for operational reasons i was posted and i feel very very nice that i could do such activities 
which were, uh, you know, the smiles on their face makes your day. So humanitarian assistance and disaster relief is one of the, you know, most satisfying activity. Though one prays that such a situation should never come. But if they come, you can't help and then you have to go and help them out. And it is one of the most satisfying job, I must yeah, say. Yeah, correct. That no, they call, it, they, they call it Anna Battis, I believe, you know. They yes, they call it Anna Battis. <laughs> <laughs> and they, you know, sometimes the weather packs up for 8, 8, 10, 10 days. Right, right. So you, you, if your aircraft can't out, go, we go for drops or D. So listening to the very sound of the AN-32 flying there brings down their nerve, nervousness. They know, okay, another day and they will land up. They will bring something, they will drop. So that is how they, it is so important for us in Chandigarh as a force to be ready to go and do the this air maintenance activity whenever possible. Fantastic. Wow. So I've taken so much of your time, but do you have a few minutes to talk about, you know, the induction of the C-17, the C-130? Yeah, yeah. Sure, and sure, I know sure. we made a we made a big change. We started buying American aircraft. What were those aircraft yes. like? And what has that induction process been like? What do, what do you feel about these two aircraft that we now have in the inventory? Uh, about C-130 Hercules, I can say I was involved right from the beginning. You know, I always in FOS, we had this kind of a new aircraft coming in. So a lot of, uh, you know, top notch officers used to get selected to go abroad and do their training. You know, I always had this, that young, you know, once you have reached that stage, when you get back and train others locally, it's time for you to either, uh, you know, uh, leave the service or uh, go to a non-flying activity. So you are not available. So when we decided about C-130 induction, what I did is only two senior people were selected. One as a CO designate and one as a flight commander designate. And the rest, all youngsters we selected, that is squad leader and below, even flying officers who went for training abroad. So their josh, their, their want, desire to do well was so much evident in all the exercises, the training. And C-130 Hercules is an excellent buy. It is a very nice combat aircraft. It has got its uh, many roles it can undertake. The ones which I mentioned, the paratrooping, the, you know, uh, assault landings and many, many things which it does. And uh, we uh, mentioned how it uh, came handy during DBO landing also. So it is a very nice aircraft. It has got a lot of good aids on which you can do nice close formation. And uh, it is a combat oriented uh, aircraft. So. What I thought about TCL in 2008 came of some use when this aircraft was inducted and now it is understood and agreed by the Air Force that yes, TCL was a good decision. So yes, Hercules is a very nice aircraft and does, you know, nice means combat oriented aircraft and we use them like that. We don't use them in normal roles. We use them in these activities only. They are always combat ready and they do a very, very good job. Whereas C-17 aircraft, you know, when we were going for buying, we always thought it is too huge for our comfort. But, the, but that partially is true, but it has really improved the load carrying capability of Indian Air Force. Right, right. You know, Air maintenance has become easier. All these uh, activities which you were talking about, the humanitarian assistance and disaster relief has become easier. You must have seen in COVID how they brought the oxygen uh, plants and uh, cylinders. And the capacity is so, means huge, the amount that we can carry. I had a fortune to ferry in the last, uh, you know, C-17, the 10th, 10th one from... Uh, and uh, its flying performance is phenomenal. It can land at uh, short airfields also, short runways. Uh, it has landed in east at Machuka, 
Oh you know, my just, goodness! Wow. Yes, you should. Uh, the you know YouTube they have that uh, thing uh, video. It is worth seeing. Your heart heart beats uh, increases so tremendously because such a huge thing coming and landing. And uh, for C17 also, we this is, is the same. We inducted a lot of youngsters in that squad. Now the both the squadrons which are doing very well. They are. With a lot of youngsters and the performance and the, the capability, airlift capability of Indian Air Force has phenomenally gone up. Phenomenally gone up because of these two inductions. Mm -hmm. That is what I can say. Tremendous. Wow. Great, sir. It's been a wonderful conversation. We've spent almost two hours. I can't thank you enough for your service and I can't thank you enough for your time that you've taken. Uh, you know, to share your experiences. You've had just a very, very fascinating and exciting career in the Air Force. And today we got an opportunity to get a small window into what you've experienced. Yes, yes, yes. Thank sure. you very much, sir. Thanks. Thanks, Gendri. I also enjoyed. Well, folks, that's all we have time for this week. Join us again next week. In the meantime, sign up for updates at blueskiespodcast.com. There you'll find links to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also write to us with your comments, questions, suggestions, and feedback from the website or to blueskies at prganapati.com. Subscribe to the podcast on any podcasting platform such as Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and even on YouTube. If you like what you heard, share it with your friends, give us a rating in your favorite podcasting app, and write us a review. It will help other people find us. I want to give my thanks to Saurav Chaudhia for our logo and Prithvik for the music. I want to reiterate that all the views expressed here are personal, and this podcast has not been approved by or reviewed by the Air Force, Ministry of Defense, or any branch of the government. In the meantime, stay safe and Jai Hind.